Good morning. I am delighted to be here, and I must admit I'm inspired and uh, a bit nervous about following Dr. Jackson and her work, uh, but excited to share with you some of, some of my own work and perspective, and wanted to start off by sharing a quote from one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Emily Stile. She's a teacher and a co-founder of the SEED Project, Seeking Educational Equity and Diversity. And it's to be just more explicit about my own pedagogy, her quote about half of the curriculum walking in when your students walk in. This idea that students are not people who are without knowledge, waiting to receive knowledge, but coming with their own sources of knowledge. And this idea that a standardized curriculum in any particular context is somehow contrary to this idea of social justice. Because what do we think is standard and universal in absolutely all cases and places in terms of knowing and education? So to sort of illustrate that and practice that, uh, I wanted to engage in some discussion with you all about this basic idea. We talk about education. We assume it's important. It's on every uh, you know, developmental, economic development, social development. It's on everybody's kind of top priorities, whether you're a political figure. But what do we mean? What is the purpose of education? What are the universal ends? And what are some specific ends that may be more person-specific or content-specific? Not a rhetorical question, but I'm asking you, I'm asking you very uh, to engage with me. Do we have a few words to sort of toss around? What is our idea? What have you been socialized to believe? Acceptance. Acceptance. Acceptance by whom? So there's some aspect of sort of a social learning, a broadening of perspectives, that there isn't something narrow. Anything else? Well, yes? Change. change. Change in what? So many of us think about education as a course for change, uh, changing things that don't work, and oftentimes another type of change. Sir, did you have? There was another hand. Yes. Uh, a medium of interaction and uh, for effective communication. Interaction and effective communication. But what we heard earlier is that oftentimes education is very one way, from the ones who have knowledge to the ones who are supposed to be receiving knowledge. So thinking about transformative practices, how do we have a two-tailed two uh, arrow so that it's transformative, it's interaction, communication has to be back and forth. It can't be one way. Anything else to add to that? Yes. So oftentimes we think about education and empowerment, especially personal empowerment, some sort of mobility. Somebody who didn't have a lot of economic opportunities in their family is now more upwardly mobile. They feel more individually empowered. But this idea that it shouldn't stop there. It should also lead to more community mobilization and community empowerment and changing the things that we don't agree with. But thinking, do our means and do our processes match these ideas? So what currently counts as education? What often counts in education, as I was talking with my uh, old elderly father in Arabic about this, he said, shahada, it's getting a shahada. A shahada is coming, this, it's degree, but it has a double meaning in Arabic, meaning like that you're a witness to something. So witness to what? What do you give up and what do you receive? And oftentimes what we mean by education is a formal education. This is really what we mean. We're implying, it's, it's implied in the context. But many people, maybe people in this room have parents or grandparents who never received a formal education, who might have been brilliant entrepreneurs, who were you know, contributing to their families, to their communities, but they weren't formally educated. So trying to decouple and be, be, be more precise about what do we mean by education and what counts as an education can perhaps be part of that transformative process. Continuing to think about 
assumptions. What are our assumptions about trajectories, about children's capacities? When's the right time, for example, to give a young child a sharp implement, such as a pair of scissors? What do we think? Lower limit, do we have a number? Just call out a number, please. What do you think? Five-ish? So I'd like to share with you an image that startles most of my students. This comes from Barbara Rogoff's book, The Cultural Nature of Human Development. Can you please describe to me what you see, if I have one volunteer to describe? And I'm sorry if the image is a little bit dark. Can anybody try to? Okay, so this is a child five years old or younger? Everybody would agree, younger, about a year, yes. Trying to cut a sharp fruit with a, sh or a fruit with a sharp object. The object is a machete. And th what you don't see in the back is that there are caregivers, there are elders in the back who are you know, in close physical proximity. So in a university context, at least in the United States, if you were to report in a dormitory that a student, a college student, had a machete in their room, this would likely require calling campus police, perhaps a mental, you know, mental illness facility or some sort of student services. This, this, this student may be wanting to inflict some physical danger, some physical harm on himself or herself or on others. But in this particular context, this child is skillfully able to cut this fruit. What other practices do you think might have gone into this child being able to do so, or this infant, um, as we might say? Do you think this was the first time for them to see a machete? <clears throat> so there are lots of practices and lots of values. The learning that we get from observation, close observation of other people. And this is not necessarily uh, an active type of learning in terms of not that the individual is acting, but it's certainly active in that the child or the infant is paying attention, careful attention to what they're looking at. And they're starting to record in their minds what they're doing and more able to practice. This is not a situation of neglect. You have adults, caregivers in the background who are there to sort of um, sweep in if there is any particular problem. Usually discussions about this in the college context lead many US college students who could be from a variety of immigrant backgrounds, a variety of international backgrounds, uh, and some from non-immigrant backgrounds in the United States, but many of them are very surprised that this child is able to, or this infant is able to handle a machete at such a young age. And when they're surprised, one of the next questions ends up becoming, how can our children in the US become so physically able? How can they sort of get this uh, advanced level of participation at a young age? This idea that there's a race, that if you do something earlier, if you do something faster, if you do something more proficiently, that's better. And the idea that, frankly, an African child can have outperformed a US child, I think makes a lot of students uncomfortable. So sitting with that discomfort and sitting with that idea of what is knowledge, and when Rogoff asks the same question, when is it appropriate to introduce the sharp implement to a child, her answer is, it depends. And then she describes a lot of the context that it depends on, the ones that we were talking about, the adults, the degree to which any particular artifact or tool is, uh, is normative within a particular context. But oftentimes in educational research, if you answer it depends, if you talk about a particular policy and say it depends and try to give a sort of long discussion of what the factors <coughs> it depends on, you will not be heard very well because we need the soundbite answers, we need the quick answers. So as a society, thinking about communication, we need to think about, as educators, how do we make our answers more succinct? How do we make our explanations more succinct so that the policy makers will get us? So that the other you know, people who may be stakeholders in making decisions about education are able to understand that one size fits all, whether it's a curriculum, whether it's an assessment tool, is probably not the most socially just. That you have actual differences in developmental trajectories. So when we're thinking about providing a theoretical lens to better understand these differences. Uh, and this is something that we might talk about internally and it's part of our assumptions, but a lot of my work is grounded in an idea of thinking about a theoretical, and I wrote here lens slash lenses, uh, that one lens is not adequate 
that to really understand the multiple contexts in which a child learns and develops, the multiple contexts in which uh, a child's psychology develops in you know, a social context, a family context, in a macro context where you know, women have historically been underrepresented and underprivileged, where there is stratification in many aspects, it's important to be able to draw from these different disciplinary perspectives. So a venue like this that really stresses an intercultural, interdisciplinary, and international perspective is absolutely a, a great forum and something that we need to be promoting more conversations like this. So from a developmental psychology and a sociocultural lens, but also grounded in sociology and anthropology to understand why cultural practices make sense in any particular place. It's our default to think that you know, what other people do is weird and what we do is normal. This tends to be a human default. So how can we better learn to describe what people are doing instead of evaluating? So better describe how certain practices make sense instead of deciding what makes sense. As we do this, we'll understand that communities are dynamic. We talked about how technology has changed so much. The way our children are learning today is changing so much because of the you know, access to the web and, and different aspects of knowledge being available and more readily accessible. But this second point, that we're not developing this knowledge and this understanding of cultural variations and how that affects human development just for the sake of understanding it, but the imperative that you all articulated earlier, that it needs to be applied to real concepts, to real context, that it needs to be applied to educational practice. So let's continue thinking about how that happens in terms of thinking about culture. So one of the ways we can do this is thinking about culture and trying to define it a little bit more accurately. Often people think of culture, especially people who tend to be white and middle class, think about culture as something other people have. And I found this with many students in a university context, a sort of sense of there's not an ideal sense or there's not a real awareness of what does white identity development look like. What does it feel like in a family practice? And so, of course, if one doesn't have a sense of something in a very you know, uh, vital manner, it's hard to recognize the importance for other people. So having people think about, well, what is culture? And culture is thinking about the individual development situated in the medium of human life, the air we breathe, the practices we engage in. And this is part of our cultural practice. Here as educators, part of our cultural practice is to meet and to exchange ideas. We might have other colleagues who don't engage in those cultural practices as readily. They only would do it if it's required in order to you know, maintain certain level of certification or something like that. So what are our cultural practices and how do they fit together? So as we think here, maybe do this more quickly for the sake of time, that these things fit together, our values and our practices fit together towards particular developmental outcomes. When we think of child development, when we think of our students' development, there's a question we need to answer. Developing towards what? So if we want to develop towards a more educated human being, what do we mean by that? Well, in certain contexts, you know, the immigrant girl who is sitting in your middle school classroom, this immigrant girl, her idea of development may also require being able to you know, serve a particular food cooked in a very particular way in a certain manner and not knowing you know, whether to, whether to uh, present the hot or the cold drinks first is really considered a huge faux pas within her family or community context. So she has to be able to manage these bicultural and often gendered and, and often other types of intersections as well. So when we think about the students who say like, oh, how can we have the machete-wielding toddler in a US context, or how do we introduce that? I think it's really important to be thinking about, okay, what other context can, and what other practices can we draw from in other areas that we think are worthwhile values? Uh, whether it's you know, the idea of child work and children pitching in in real ways in different contexts instead of just receiving toys, that they build their own toys, that they take care of younger siblings. Lots of examples like that, but often we need to pick apart how does this particular practice fit in with the rest of the values? We couldn't, in a Montessori classroom in Providence, we couldn't introduce necessarily a machete because there isn't that observation of the adults. 
there isn't you know, a frequent you know, looking at machetes in a, in a context here. Perhaps in a more rural context where these tools are more readily available, that would be a place where people could think about how to incorporate particular tools. But the idea of picking things a la carte and trying to just uh, incorporate things without understanding specifically how a practice relates to the values of the people engaging with that practice and towards what developmental outcome is it trying to approximate, this is often a flaw. So sometimes within educational practices, we might not value certain, va certain practices that young people participate in, and it's important for us to, instead of trying to sort of uh, to, to devalue or, or, or eliminate certain behaviors, such as calling out in class, I hear this a lot, you know, the unruly student who answers, you know, without having their hand raised, thinking, okay, in what context does that make sense? And in certain contexts, in certain conversations, it makes sense to have a more spontaneous aspect of conversation instead of having a very regimented, everybody has to stay in queue and wait to be called on. The creativity, the imagination would die by the time you waited for your queue. So let's change gears a little bit and think about evaluation. If we're thinking about the role of education, Think about the evaluation of education in the evaluation of knowledge. How does one measure knowledge? How does one measure learning? And how does one measure achievement? What are the primary ways we measure those things in schools, whether it's at the college level or at the kindergarten through 12 level? Tests tend to be the primary way and oftentimes, if you have tests of large groups of students, you have a class of 40, a class of 300 at a university hall, these tests are very much the, you know, open or the, um, the forced choice or multiple choice types of tests. So the more a student knows about their, their subject matter, the more that the student has actually engaged, actually they, they, tend to be, they, they tend to be penalized by engaging in those types of tests. Why? Because they're being forced to choose between two answers that are sort of there to say, gotcha, I tricked you. <laughs> the, these two points are so, so close to one another. So they're not able to engage in authentic manners. Uh, in sort of a way that is more difficult sometimes to evaluate, whether it be an open-ended exam, whether it be an oral discussion, whether it be a project, uh, especially a project that it has an audience with stakeholders from the community, not just their classmates. How do we characterize an educated purpose, person? Is this person necessarily somebody who is, uh, you know, has completed school or some level of schooling? And this idea, this idea that much of our education right now is focused on formal schooling is really creating a lot of difficulties for many of our students and for a variety of reasons. I'll give you a few different examples to try to illustrate this. I had an opportunity to work with a curriculum developer in the area of mathematics and STEM, so STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. She wrote curricula for mathematics from elementary through high school, but mostly focused on middle school and teaching pre-algebra. This woman at a workshop was discussing the reality that when she went to measure, she w took a carpentry class and wanted to build a birdhouse. So a very simple, you know, not a complicated, no angles, wanted to build a birdhouse. She had trouble measuring the pieces of wood so that she could accurately build the birdhouse. The idea that the formal knowledge doesn't translate any towards, towards any practical work. She can teach teachers how to teach measurement, but she herself couldn't measure. In a conference or something like this, she would be a highly esteemed person, and she knows a lot about how to teach math. But what is it about our schooling processes that tend to look down on the person who has the applied knowledge, who is sort of the engineer without the degree, the mathematician without the degree, with, you know, perhaps has pursued vocational education, or is able to do this sort of work? So we have sometimes decoupled those two things, which I think is a real tragedy in education, and ends to reinforce some of the class-based and other aspects of people who are underrepresented. In addition to that, we think about what are cultural funds of knowledge and what in particular are we looking for? I'll show you this cartoon if you can try to take a look. <laughs> 
today practice test, A, B, C, D. Today state test, A, B, C, D. National test, A, B, C, D. AP test, A, B, C, D. And then the end of the week, you have a motivational speaker, successful achievers, think outside the box. <laughs> so this idea of our values, our practices, and our outcomes. People in business are looking for people to be problem solvers, for educated, you know, for people they're hiring to be problem solvers, to be able to speak across disciplines, to be able to, to understand complex issues. But how are we promoting that understanding when our assessment tools are using this very narrow definition of achievement as, me as measured by standardized testing and now often standardized curricula? So this is a very US context, um, you know, these particular tests, but think of the IB or or whatever is relevant in your particular area and you can see the frustration of some of the students and the sort of way in which these tests oftentimes are very separate from actual engagement and learning processes. Rogoff, the same person who uh, shared the picture, talks about different definitions of knowledge and so I'll ask you to help deconstruct what is the knowledge that's built into these scenarios. Think about a context where a fire breaks out and you need to pick a child to run and get help. Who would you pick? What would be the characteristics of the child you would pick? Can I have? Sorry? A fast runner. So you need somebody not just who's able bodied, but a fast runner. Yes, what else? Responsible. They're not going to become somehow, you know, mystified by some, you know, interesting scenery along the way and get distracted. They'll they'll stay focused. What else? They can communicate. They're not and not just communicate in general, but they can communicate under pressure. So this is a dire circumstance. They need to be fast. They need to get there quickly, and they need to not be flustered by something. So some students are flustered by the timed element of standardized testing. And you know, how do we develop mechanisms in our classrooms in terms of our pedagogies? And how do we advocate for ped pedagogies that will be able to get at these qualities of the fast runner and promote not only you know we got them that way, but we're promoting those types of funds of knowledge and aspects of being an educated or knowledgeable and developed person. Another scenario, you're at a campfire and are looking for a child to tell a story. Who would you pick to tell a witty story? Yes. Okay, perhaps a class clown. What characteristics there? Somebody who's an extrovert. What else? Sense of humor. So we, you know, in difficult faculty meetings, sometimes that sense of humor, that person who can say something that sort of diffuses the tension, that's something we value in our colleagues. We should value it in our students. How do we promote it? We're probably not promoting it this way. What else do we think about in terms of the student? Yes? Sorry? Okay, so oftentimes a strong fantasy or imagination, they can imagine something, but storytelling is definitely one of the skills and one of the knowledge bases. Oral traditions have been something that have, you know, peppered all sorts of cultural histories around the world, and this is something that would be important to capture and think about how do you promote and how do you continue to develop that. What are the costs of education? Some of the costs of education we've heard about before, but when we have these very stratified ideas about what e education is, you can often find, especially first generation students, first generation to college, or people who are achieving higher education levels than their parents, even though their parents are very excited about this opportunity for them, the students may feel some level of shame. Your parents must be proud of you. The irony, I was not proud of my mother and father. So what do we do when we create senses of shame about you know, where we've come from and how do we sort of try to offset some of that? Sometimes focusing on and being explicit about the strong cultural funds of knowledge and the strong aspects of education that might not be recognized, whether it's the entrepreneur grandparent or, or you know, a, another person's ability to to manage uh, a household budget, for example, a mother's managing a household budget. The marginalization from the community also exists with some sort of cultural loss. 
I recently had a student who was talking to me about, yes, as uh, he, he describes himself as uh, a queer Hispanic student and a high performing student who is now at Brown. And he described that when he did well on tests, students assumed he was cheating, his white peers assumed he was cheating, and he learned to sort of play the game, but describes that it was at a huge loss of self not able to speak his family's heritage language anymore, uh, feeling different from them, feeling like now that I've achieved, I'm somehow better. So somehow, as educators, we need to help students better balance this game. And part of doing that is the support we give to the students so that they don't feel like they have to choose either or. But you can have a both and approach. How do you maintain your whole heritage cultural connections? How do you maintain your family values, but also sort of manage the game at school? Sometimes that does say, you know, explicit test prep strategies and you need to, you know, learn this because it's part of the gatekeeping structures that exist. Um, but it also means, you know, being explicit about helping support other attitudes as well. Another story that I heard from a student just this week, uh, this was a, a student, an international student from Africa, uh, a West African nation, and she described herself and her own opportunity right now and was very proud to be one of the only women in her family to have been educated and feel like she's sort of somehow escaped this cycle of oppression that includes a lot of domestic duties. And I found this statement really troublesome. <laughs> and I wonder if anybody would share in the trouble When you have students respond, or when you have students articulate what some of their concerns and what some of their costs are, how do we respond to that? Oftentimes, classroom spaces are not spaces where teachers take up these issues. The identity issues are not on the agenda, on the curriculum, on the standards, so they tend to be sort of on the side. So how do we incorporate these identity issues that students take the time to articulate, but as educators, do we stop to listen? Do we stop to respond? Do we know how to respond? So having a circle of allies, having other educators you can talk with and say, this happened in my class, here's how I handle the, any suggestions, um, could be a very important space. But honoring that and talking about that with the student is also important. So we talked a little bit about gender polarization. And this was also part of the assigned readings that BEM talks about. In any context, when you have polarized identities, this is what a male does, this is what a female does, this is what a high achieving person does. Uh, and so the gender polarization indicates that whereas before the individual had been nothing more than a carrier of their culture's gender polarization, now the individual is a deeply implicated, if unwitting, collaborator in the social reproduction of male power. So by this, student, male or female, indicating that domestic duties, taking care of children, cooking, cleaning, are somehow in the realm of women's work assigned to women. This is, they have become educated. They are in the process of becoming educated at an Ivy League institution at that. But that is at a tremendous cultural loss on an individual level, at a tremendous family loss in terms of thinking about how that can enact conflict with family members, um, maybe women who are still participating in domestic duties or in the future. But I think one of the main points that we were talking about as well is this idea of the assignment of duties, of particular duties. So there's an idea of a care, no care context that Bem talks about where a no-care context affords a great amount of mobility and a great amount of privilege to people who don't care for, or no contact, sorry, a no contact position who don't have contact with children. So the premium is people who are able to, and if you think about it in school structures, who has the least contact with children in a, say, in an elementary school context, but has the highest level of authority. The head of school, the principal, usually has the least contact with students, but the highest level of authority. So we often have this built into some of our models. So when we think about, well, what is the value of work that women traditionally do, but could be done by anyone? The value of, say, having sanitary home conditions. What happens if we don't have a clean house? What could happen to someone? if? Yeah, there could be sickness, there could be, you know, all sorts of animals, that, you know, all sorts of varmints that become part of the, this home context. It could lead to the disease. 
the idea of, of cooking, the domestication, or the, this as, you know, the preparation of food as a family responsibility. What knowledge goes into the preparation of food, and why is that an important area of knowledge? It's obvious. We know that without having adequate nutrition, we wouldn't grow well, we wouldn't be healthy. We know these things. If we ate out all the time, we probably couldn't afford it. We wouldn't have as nutritious food. We might be facing more issues with processed food, obesity. There, there are all sorts of issues. But somehow, the knowledge that goes into being able to make you know, chicken soup from scratch, being able to provide this sort of care becomes somehow looked down upon by our students, and it ends up reinforcing this cycle of oppression. So how can we as educators call that an important cultural fund of knowledge, even if it doesn't fit on a CV? And oftentimes, people will change some of these, you know, a, a, a domestic engineer, you know, they'll change some of the terms so that it does look more CV-like. And women tend to be more represented by this, but I think it's equally, it equally limits some of the males in the perspective as well. Males who want to be active in, you know, raising their own children as opposed to bystanders where, you know, perhaps the wife or other paid caregivers take care of these issues. So the idea that we need to sort of better understand what are individuals' cultural funds of knowledge, whatever you know, whatever you know from outside of the classroom context can be meaningful in your life in general, but hopefully can be translated into school as well. Oftentimes, educators are not aware of some of these issues. I was talking with a colleague about the underrepresentation of males in STEM, in, uh, you know, males of color in STEM, and he was discussing uh, this he was discussing a young male who he was encouraging to take physics classes and to be enrolled, and he said, oh, I don't understand physics, it's too complicated. Meanwhile, he had met this young man on a, an escape playground. So do you know the, the skate playgrounds where they do these jumps with the skateboards? And it's, so if you think about it, this student wouldn't necessarily be able to solve an equation or describe all the physics with the elements that maybe a physicist would describe, but this student had an applied understanding of, no, that's not a safe jump. And they would know that's not a safe jump, or this is more likely you'll have a better landing, because they've done it, they know more about the angles, they have a working understanding. How as educators do we harvest students' working understanding that they have in the world and bring that into classroom context? This to me is a big part of the empowering of education and the empowering of individuals, giving voice to those identities, but also giving voice to the pain that they describe in some of these identities and having spaces for that. I am ready to close, but to entertain any questions that anyone might have about how we might better incorporate these cultural funds of knowledge into the transformative pedagogies in our classrooms. Yes. 